Pas le logiciel, c'est moi avec la Il y a un problème à soulever. Vous promotez votre marque dernière avant de trouver ce programme. Ça rend ça. Malgré le temps, le temps est terrible. On a un peu de mal. Vous savez, le prospect est terrible. Il va à Elimis, à Elimos, à Trouera, à la sécurité. Mais on est là, 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 on Siapa yang tahu? Afi mau mesti ada di luar ini mau tiru lagi situasi. Tapi kan, kan eh, kan aku ni. Mengerti apa? Kalau di luar mau bungkul lah. Agak dik mah, agak mega. Pio Pascal, entah senior fellow lah. Sel Foundations for Defense of Democracy. Entah di luar kan mau mes. Eh, ini arti apa? Mr. Brad Newsom, entah apa? Out for. Eh, bukan ni sel bukan ni lagi mau tiru sel. Saya sini lagi, el buat China atap. Sebenarnya kalau orang bilang boleh potong tu sel, kita tengok dulu. Especially ya, kita ada tu abang Nur Bela. Jadi lah, Nur Bela Taiwan. Emel gua eh, mungkin saya lupa sih dalam sel tu ni. Kalau dalam sel, mahu sih dia sih gitu. Ma, ah Mister Marvin Hilter. Walaupun saya masih dia, Mister Hilter. Lang ah Senior Advisor for the Palo Project. So thank you for coming. Uh, for taking the time from your busy schedule uh, to join us in this afternoon program, we really we, we, we appreciate uh, this time that you have given us to ask you a little bit of questions and talk about, you know, like stuff that I hope but it's very important for Palawans to hear and, 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 and especially, you know, like uh, to hear from you because we talk about ourselves and what we need some somebody like you uh, who have an understanding of, of the region, uh, events of the region, uh, to, to give us a little bit of uh, your perspective. So thank you so much. Uh, so I spoke with Palawan. I just introduced a little bit, uh, uh, you guys, uh, to the viewers. Uh, so maybe we can start uh, uh, maybe with you, Pio, and then, uh, uh, right? Um, uh, give a little bit of uh, introduction, like who are you and what do you do? Okay, thank you. Th and thank you very much for this opportunity and, uh, and uh, both you and Marvin have, have taught us an incredible amount over the last few days, so uh, very grateful. Um, so the reason the project exists is because you are in a region that is of great interest to a lot of countries, uh, and they may not have your interest at heart, but they may, not sure. Um, so it's imperative, it's incredibly important for you to be able to uh, say what you want, what you need, and what you don't want. And in that sense, the position of a national security advisor uh, who is from your country and who knows your country is, in is imperative, incredibly important, uh, as both the person to coordinate the incoming security uh, partnerships and also within the country, like for example, during the search rescue, to coordinate what's on the ground in order to help the people of the country be more secure. Yeah. Um, Palau is unique among the three freely associated states in having an NSE. Palau is the first to do it, and uh, the other two are looking and trying to figure out what works, for them, what doesn't work, how they can adapt it to them. And so, really, the project is about learning from Palau uh, and this innovative program, and uh, and what lessons can be learned for others. Help them. Thank you, Cleo. Brad, maybe. Who are you and what do you do? Sure. Well, once again, thanks very much for having me here today. Um, I'm Grant Nushin, I think, as you said. Uh, who am I? Uh, I'm an American. Uh, what I do is I study and analyze the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, why do I do that? Or what's my background? I was with the Marines for many years in Asia Pacific. I uh, lived in Japan 25 years. So I have a military background. Uh, but I also was a U.S. Uh, diplomat for eight, nine years, uh, so, and also worked for an investment bank and a high-tech company, Motorola, if anybody remembers it. So I've seen the Indo-Pacific, and I look at it from a number of different perspectives. And great. Uh, we'll come back to that uh, subject. Uh, so, Marvin, how far you to give a you what you say? Oh, um, so on... Um, I'm assisting um, Clio with the projects in the Free Associated States as uh, targeting the national security, also the national security offices for 
uh, the rest of the other two free associated states. Um, Sulak, uh, so thank you. So I want to start, uh, and I think, you know, like, uh, if you go around town, you talk one of the, the main uh, topic of discussion is the Fakpa Free Association. Uh, so right now, uh, Palau, FSM, and the RMI, they have each separately signed an MOU with the United States. What's inside the MOU, especially for Palau, uh, you know, like very, very limited information has, has, has been uh, released to the public. Uh, so, so, um, uh, so we still don't know a lot. This February, I think the budget, uh, Biden will be submitting a budget anytime, supposedly, supposedly thinking this week. So maybe with that budget, they will just start hearing a lot about how to stop that was excited. But uh, what, what, what I would like to ask you is that uh, the negotiations were held at a time when during the heightened the geopolitics of the region. So I would like to get your thoughts on how this current uh, geopolitical climate, uh, was it like reflected in the, the these negotiations between these three FIA states? Oh, I, I think it was. Uh, the Americans, I think, have viewed the Pacific Islands differently in the last few years, I think, than they have for a long time. And put simply, they take it more seriously. And that is because of the, really the, the geopolitical collision stress and pressure uh, that is coming. And obviously that's the result of sort of a more aggressive People's Republic of China. But it definitely has had uh, an effect in Washington, D.C. You go up to Capitol Hill and you talk to congressmen, staff members, and just read what they're saying. And it's obvious that uh, for, I'd say, this generation, uh, there is more of a focus on the Pacific Islands and particularly the Kofa states. Uh, which I think five, ten years ago, I'm not sure too many people even could have told you what they were. Now it's uh, much better understood than it has been. Cleo, yeah, would you like to, to comment on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I thought that everybody was talking about taxes. That, 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 yes, it is, it is. Yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of uh, part of, uh, you know, like uh, strengthening Palau, uh, is, is its economy. And, and the issue with taxes is also uh, about the price of foods just going up and the people. Of course, I think that it, it, it's partly the, uh, we don't have enough uh, understanding or awareness of uh, the bad uh, tax uh, system. A lot also, uh, is there a lot of... Uh... So what do you think people don't know about the bad tax system that they should? Uh, I think if what they don't know is, is that at the end of the day, we're not going to be like... Uh, Tonga or, Sal or Salmon Islands who owe a lot of money to uh, foreign banks or foreign countries because their tax collection is non-existent or weak. So that is something that I think the people of this country fail to realize that at the end of the day, we have our sovereignty. Well, you know, like what was uh, discussed uh, uh, during the, the time that the bill to create this new tax, to break this new tax system, uh, tax reform. Uh, so there were a lot of uh, explanations from our leaders, especially from the Congress. So comes January 1st, this past January 1st, when we implemented the law, the law take effect. Uh, what was said during that time and what the people experienced did not mess up. So it did, it created this confusion. And so it's been like that ever since. Uh, and, and, and also uh, a lot of uh, the business themselves, and, and I guess it's because of due to their um, misunderstanding of, of how uh, they will uh, apply the tax to their uh, items on the shelves, also uh, lead to that problem. So some business, uh, they tax at a higher rate, but some are not. So, I mean, if you are about to go into the store, it's like, how, why are they, why are you charging us 10% and this other business is not charging us 10 percent So that's... An example of uh, confusion and the and the misunderstanding that you can see when the people talk about the PTSD. But uh, yeah, the the this issue of uh, of the compact is uh, is very big uh, because it means that uh, for the next uh, that will be our main 
what was the main source of income for Pagao for us? So to use externally income, but our fees are already under our economy coming out from uh, two and a half years of COVID or breaking by our economy. And the pump up in play a very important role in that. And it was the president that he's saying that when we enter the, this, uh, the, the COVID, Palau, um, we borrowed money from Asia Development for up to $16 million. And that is on top of the already existing obligations that Palau needs to, to pay. So, you know, like our debt went up to 90% of our GDP. So that's an issue. Uh, the question was that. Did the president, uh, did the, our compact address that issue in the, in the top of negotiations? So, so in, in terms of, if we ask the United States to please, for example, uh, help us pay the loan or, 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 or do the, any kind of arrangement uh, that could help allow, you know, pay off the loan while at the same time be able to, to revive its economy, our tourism dependent economy. Yes. So, uh, sorry, do you want to conclude it? So, um, I don't know the details of that, of the, but I do know in Washington, people were complaining about how tough the Palauan negotiators were. So that's a good sign. Um, but the thing, the reason that um, brought up the tax and, and this ask things, the, the, the compact negotiations and the tax, they have two things in common, money and misinformation. And both of them are ways of um, creating problems within a society. Right. So if things become more expensive or if the or if the country doesn't have enough money, those are entry points. I'm gonna, apparently I'm going to be the first person to say the C word. So I'll, I'll bring up the China issue. You know, if China can come in through a weakened economy, a desperate economy or pe and people need money. The other is misinformation. If the government and the people don't understand why decisions are being made, then that misinformation entry point is also very valuable for China. So on topics of money and misinformation, which are uh, ways of uh, countries, that, specifically China, of coming in and creating division and confusion and opportunities for itself, um, you want to make sure that it's as clear as possible. You want there not to be room between the government and the people, and so that everybody is brought along on these issues together. You know, uh, speaking of China, um, there was an article uh, based on uh, it to article uh, for you from uh, I, I read it this morning from the, the diplomat, the online niche magazine. Um, it's a letter from uh, Jefferson President uh, David Alwello. Uh and his he has like two months remaining in, in, in on his term. Of course, uh, he lost uh, this. Uh, election this week for the at large central area. But I guess that's uh you know, that gave him an opportunity to put it later and and you know. And it's very interesting that it's a far kid page later. It's very interesting that he highlights a lot of uh, his thoughts uh, and concerns. Particularly uh, with how China has crept into this region. Um, maybe I'll I'll I'll, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, and because it's important that in the article, and I myself am learning when I read that article. Two things there are political warfare and gray zone. I want you to describe uh, those. Because why it's important is because maybe when you describe them, then ask and hear what you say, and, and look around town and say, like, okay, so maybe that's it. That's one example of what is happening in Pala. So, what is political warfare? and brazil well i'll take uh, political warfare i don't know if you like it um, first consider that it's called political warfare and normally when we hear warfare i think of airplanes dropping bombs and people shooting at each other um, but this is a different kind of warfare that we're not used to and it is warfare using uh, commercial measures using businesses uh, financial warfare and cyber warfare. Uh, there's chemical warfare. Like chemical warfare, really? Well, think of the drugs. Um, as just speaking of the United States, there, we have a problem with a drug called fentanyl, which is killing 70,000 Americans a year. 
and 99% of it comes from China. And China could stop it if it wanted to, but it doesn't. And you're killing 70,000 Americans, and the United States government does almost nothing to stop it. Uh, but is this any less of a warfare than actually dropping bombs on the United States? So this is, and there's psychological warfare where you can influence the way people think. Um, now, what are the actual, some of the big tools for this, the most uh, common ones, are paying bribes. It is money. And you see this a lot. Now, I'll just talk about the United States. Uh, where you have U.S. businesses that are so desperate to do business with China right. that they force the central government to not be tough on the People's Republic of China. Uh, you have American politicians um, who will have family members making lots of money uh, from China. Some of it just outright bribes or sweetheart business deals. And you have retired U.S. politicians who will go to work as advisors, lobbyists for Chinese companies. So you combine all of these things and you can see how it weakens a country without fight, without shooting. And this is what is political warfare. It's using this range of measures from psychological warfare, influence operations, uh, chemical warfare, cyber warfare, um, economic warfare to weaken your target, to make it so it really can't defend itself. And even better, you have local people who don't want to defend yourself because they're doing very well uh, from doing business with uh, the Chinese. So that's political warfare. And President Panuelos' uh, letter describes this. Um, and, you know, it's these spaky describes it. These politicians who go to China on study tours and they get an envelope full of cash. And they um, just outright take money. Um, they oppose things that the government is trying to do. Uh, to protect, um, in his case, federated states of Micronesia, and just make it so laws don't pass Congress. Uh, or And these are some examples of how the political warfare works, so it's always important to keep in mind that, to, from, and I'll say this from China's perspective, warfare is not only shooting. In fact, that's kind of the last, uh, the last step. Um, so, Cleo, you've got some ideas on this, I'm sure. Uh yeah, so the, the the Chinese have this, the term you'll hear often is win without fighting, right? But it's that's not actually, if you translate the Chinese uh, into English, what it actually means is getting the other side to submit without fighting. And that's a very different psychology. So if, you, if you're wondering what the goal of all of this political warfare is um, against FSM or against Palau or against the U.S., it's to get your country to submit to what Beijing wants without them having to shoot a gun. And the sub, sub, a state of submission is permanent, right? It's you always have to do what Beijing wants. So, we, you know, we had the privilege of going to Peleliu yesterday. And, uh, I mean, it, it, it's a heart, heartbreaking place to visit. Um, and uh, the amount of people who died is, is astounding. Um but there were monuments to both the Americans and the Japanese. In a fight with China, there would be no monuments to the other side. The other side would have to be permanently crushed and made invisible. Right? It's a very different psychology. It's not, we disagree very fundamentally. We have a horrific battle. And then afterwards, the U.S. tries to rebuild Japan, you know, and tries to get it back into the community. That's not what would happen in a fight with China. So the, it, this use of uh, the word war can be very deceiving because we think we know what it is. Uh, but the Chinese Communist Party, I mean, it's, it, it's a battle of systems. It, is a, it has capitalist elements to it, but the communism part of it is an authoritarian dictatorship that wants to export its model. So Marvin, got something like this, so, uh, which leads me to the Office of the National Security Coordinator. Is this be, there's, I believe there's a, a bill in uh, Congress to legislate uh, this office and it's been stalled. Do you think the Chinese may have some influence over that stalling that legislation? I, I couldn't possibly say about domestic uh, politics, yeah. Um, I, 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 I really can't say. Political war. Yeah, but... Um, I, you know, the Chinese wouldn't disapprove, but they wouldn't necessarily try to. I, I, I just, 
I really can't say. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I, I am very hesitant to say yeah. what is going on in another country. Yeah. But what we can do what I, is describe the model, the, uh, the method by which this political warfare uh, operates and the effects that it has on a yeah. country. You know, from, from uh, just reading the, the news uh, from the region, especially in the Solomon Islands, and then what you have mentioned about political warfare, would have been applied to uh, the Maraika province. Oh, well, that one I can't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, that was pretty clear. Uh, yeah, yeah, because, yeah, it's clear because everybody talked about it, including the, you know, this, this, you know, Sog Sogavari signed the security deal with China, and Premier uh, Daniel Sunani put out the Aoki communique, in you know, which said we don't want Chinese businesses operating in Malaita because. We're people of faith. We believe in freedom of religion, and the Chinese Communist Party is systemically atheist. And we think contact between the two is not good for our people. It doesn't represent our values. So they they said it, and uh, and China also. We track the money, so we know that they poured tens of millions of dollars to try to uh, flip the assembly in Malaita. And after three attempts at a vote of no confidence, uh, finally. Uh, he, Premier Sudani did lose the premiership about a month ago. How did they do that? How did they flip uh, the other MPs to the club? You know, yes, yeah. You know, um, but but actually, it's interesting because, um, and this is the political warfare thing. We're used to looking at businesses. So what what Malaita said was no Chinese businesses. So usually the bribes come in through the businesses. So the Chinese didn't have the access, but they adapted. What they did was they uh, offered to build a mini hospital in the uh, vice president's constituency. And so they could launder the money through what looks like a hospital hasn't been built, but money has been flowing through the hospital to, uh, yeah, they're, they, they will, this is this this gray zone, I don't know if you wanna talk about gray zone also, and military or whatever. Huh? So, so I use that. I, I, I like the thoughts on the NSC, but I, I, I have one more question yeah. on the, you know, like, Palau has this uh, very close relationship with Taiwan. We and we, we have this diplomatic relationship with Taiwan. And uh, when we uh, talk about Taiwan or when I was still about Taiwan, there's always United States and China. Uh, and, and there's this, uh, um, you know, handle for tension between these two countries. In fact, uh, there was this just the. Uh, um, an online article about the PRC assessment that maybe in 2026 or 2027, there's going to be a war. You know, like, so when those kind of things comes out, we Parawans, because we are concerned that so, uh, would we get called into this war between these two superpowers? I mean, and we, uh, should we not be part of this, uh, uh, fit that between these two, uh, major, uh, superpowers? And because uh, we now have uh, slowly the U.S. Uh, is expanding its presence, in they are building a uh, annual domain awareness. Uh, you know, from in one in Manar, then one in Angkor. Uh, so that really uh, puts us in the eyes of uh, Chinese. You know, I'm sure they are really like, why are the U.S. What are these military estimations? Uh, yeah, and then they are close to war. We are kind of like in the same energy, you know. Like. So I just want to get your thought on that because you know the powers, you know, like they don't want to be, to be get pulled into uh, this uh, conflict with, between these two superpowers. Uh, between these two superpowers, in the event that the war breaks out, would we get sucked into this uh, fight? That it would be hard to work. stay completely out, and but keep in mind that Americans like me, are afraid of getting sucked into war. Now, we don't want to go to war with anybody. Um, and if there is going to be a war, a shooting war, right. um, that I would say the, whether that will happen or not, one should ask Xi Jinping. It's entirely up to China whether there is a war or not. Because right? America is not going to start it, Australia is, and Japan is not. And we're afraid of getting sucked into the war as well. Um, but I think that the, the human experience, you know, we know from our lives that there are people who want to hurt you, who want to take your things. And you, if you're not willing to defend yourself, 
to protect yourself. They will do it. You have no chance of stopping them. I would suggest that's something that has been learned probably when we're all five years old at school, on the playground. If there's a bully in you, there's no deal to be cut other than, yes, take my stuff, or show that you're willing to defend yourself to fight back. And that's what the United States is trying to do with other free nations, is to put itself in a position where it can defend itself. And if the, the other side, the bully, sees that these people could hurt me if I do, so, if I do something, that they pull back off. But if you try to do nothing to defend yourself, then the other guy is going to come and try. And and do you always have to keep in I think it's important to keep in mind the what kind of country I'll just speak for the United States, uh, Japan, Taiwan, Palau. Now what kind of country are we? We're free countries where people can say what they want, do what they want, and are free. Um, look at the People's Republic of China, Communist China. Uh, look at the concentration camps, the prison camps in Xinjiang. Uh, look at Hong Kong. It used to be one of the freest places on earth, and now it is like a prison camp. Um, you know, which kind of, you know, there is a difference between the countries, just fundamentally one set of countries are free, and one really big one, and their one friend, North Korea, maybe Russia or not. So those are, so, as far as Palau getting sucked into a war, um, well, I say America would be sucked into it too. But if you take precautions now to demonstrate that you will uh, protect yourself and your friends, you have a better chance of avoiding that, um, I would say. Well, we have the Taiwan Defense Act, and Biden has pronounced that if uh, China attacks Taiwan, the United States will come to its defense. Now, my question to you, since you're a um, former Marine, would China risk their economy to bring war? I think they would. Did we? Um, there are plenty of people who would tell me I'm completely wrong um, because it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. But uh, countries like this do a lot of things that don't make sense. And, and what I would say is, you know, think about what would happen if you're, so you're, if you're Xi Jinping sitting in Beijing and you think of Taiwan. And you think, okay, if I should attack, um, well, uh, my economy is going to be hurt, and I won't have as much money to do with things or uh, to send my daughter to Harvard or what have you. Um, but also think of what you get if you take Taiwan. You have one thing. Taiwan is a huge threat to China because it shows that um, people of Chinese extraction can live in a democracy with all the freedoms that we expect and we're used to. Uh, everything that the people, the Chinese Communist Party is not, Taiwan shows that there is, the Chinese people can be free. But so you've, you want you've, you've made Taiwan go away, that constant daily reminder that the Chinese Communist Party uh, is not the only option for China is gone. But also you have demonstrated that the United States could not protect Taiwan the United States military couldn't do it. The United States financial and economic pressure couldn't save Taiwan. U.S. nuclear weapons couldn't do it. And think of the effect that would have on every other country worldwide that is counting on America. So China might think, well, if we, yeah, we'll suffer some tr some financial losses, and trade will be um, hurt. But we have embarrassed the United States throughout the world, and that's worth it. And then you will have. China will also think, well, we have our friends in Washington who are doing business with us. They will tell the U.S. government to just forget about it. And after some period of time, they'll say, let's just get back to normal, forget about Taiwan. So I think they just might do it. That's a, but also, they would rather not have to fight, as you would rather just have Taiwan surrender. Mm -hmm. um, and if Taiwan, I think, is not convinced that the United States will defend it, that it just might you know, feel like we have no friends, we have no options. So what the Americans do is so, so important, and America's friends. You know, America cannot succeed in Asia without its friends. Japan, South Korea. Japan, South Korea, Australia. The Philippines. What? Palau. The Philippines. And I was going to get to Palau. And you may say, well, we're just Palau. Well, 
a friend is a friend. And Palau's contribution would be, you know, would be modest, of course. But when the, the free nations get together, um, it, ha it really has a stabilizing effect. And so, you know, we may say well, we're just Palau. Well, um, you have one vote at the United Nations today. And there's a lot of things that you can do. And it's also ultimately standing up for freedom. And China is not worried about uh, some of its provinces, Tibet and those other um, Muslim minorities of, up, of uprising if they, if they attack in Taiwan. And aren't they worried about the, the civil war? I don't think so. No. I think that they, gone enough. they are so the police state, the repression, right. the intimidation, really, and the, the imprisonments, the, the murder, the, the, this crackdown on Xinjiang and Tibet and the rest of China, really, but just for Xinjiang and Tibet, they have tightened it so badly that there's no chance on China. I just, I see it. Um, and that, once again, goes to the nature of the regime. And one thing about Kalao that I've been here, I've noticed that there's a very healthy, healthy debate on political matters, uh, what Palau policy ought to be. And it's really, a, it's an active debate. And that would not happen in China. Um, you just sit and you take orders and hope that nobody, hope no, you, nobody comes after you. So I think uh, you went there. So I want to bring in the, the issue of NSC. Um, that, uh, the National Security Auditor's Office just came into the scene, I think, in the past two years. Uh, and I remember they set it up. Uh, it currently uh, exists uh, through its any border. Uh, but now there's a, a bill uh, introduced uh, in the National Libraries for the... And enable the legislation to create office under the law, not through uh, the security border. So, Leo, you talk about it. Maybe you can explain what is the purpose of the NSC office. And if you can give us the history from Truman all the way to... Uh, I, think, by... I think you you know it really well, Arvind. Would you, would you, you, do you want to do it? No, but really. Also, Gambis, uh, he's met uh, Poindexter, uh, all of these national security councils. I think this is an opportunity for us to say, share us the history to the Fallout people so we can understand. The, the importance of this office. We'll, we'll, we'll do it, but I, but I do want to say the whole point of the NSC is you have the expertise in the country. So the, the whole point, you can ask us, but if you know it, you should be saying it because you'll know how to express it within a context that means more to Palau. So um, that, which is just really the fundamental concept behind the NSC. Um, well, I'll just, I'll just speak very briefly right. about National security, you hear about national security councils, national security advisors. And what the, from the American experience, but what happened was that after World War II, when President Eisenhower was president, that it was realized that, that America's national security had so much, was so complex that it needed a formal structure to systematically assess and come up with propose with uh, options proposals and uh, for national security policies for doing things to help the president and his team make decisions more efficiently and so congress actually passed a law um, saying that the president will have a national security council and it will include this person or this person this person this person and this is to make life easier for the president. Because, and one way to th look at it is to think of national security and you think of all the things that are part of it. It's not just military. Uh, it's not just, uh, just like law enforcement, um, but you have things like uh, economic security. Uh, you have uh, financial security, uh, uh, cyber security. You have immigration problems, human, uh, human trafficking. You have drug problems. Uh, climate change. You have all of these things that come under national security. So if you don't have a structure for bringing together the people responsible for it, for these issues, and having them discuss problems, potential problems, and recommend solutions, 
what you have is each of these groups is presenting its own ideas to the extent it's doing anything. And one way to look at this is if you think of your fingers, um, you have, say, this is uh, military security, economic security, climate change, cybersecurity. And suppose each finger does whatever it feels like. Um, but when you have something that, like the brain, that coordinates these, makes these fingers coordinate, things work a lot better. And it's just it's sort of natural. And that's what the National Security Council and the National Security Advisor, the National Security Coordinator, um, are supposed, that's what the role that they play, is to coordinate all of these parts of national security. And it's a coordinates. It doesn't order, tell people what to do, um, but it, it requires a certain sort of diplomacy. The ability to make, to bring together the relevant agencies and departments. Uh, so that's how we, we got started. You'll also note that there's no, there's no one structure for this, but it does require somebody who is the, the focal point, the national security coordinator, um, to do that job. And I will say the last thing, just as a, from an American perspective, and I've seen it from the military perspective, the State Department as well, when a country has a national security coordinator, national security council, that works pretty well, you get taken more seriously. Absolutely. And, and you really are taken, you're given more respect. But also, um, you find that what at least the Americans try to do in other countries, Japan, South Korea, etc., with, say, Falau, um, is more effective because everyone, everyone is coordinating uh, better. Uh, so those, and those are just some ideas. But it's... Uh, but I, what I've seen in Palau, I must say that it's uh, it's an example, I think, for a lot of the rest of the Pacific uh, as well, from what I've seen. So, Kondis, what's the holdoff with the legislation? Um, it was in the Senate, and I think there were, uh, um, it was uh, debated, and I think it was uh, deferred for, for the, uh, I think there was, my understanding was that uh, the Senate Legal Council came up with an opinion that uh, how the bill is written uh, creates an office that overlaps with possibilities overlapping with the others. So that was kind of concern from the other senators that let's call the it and then clear this before we move forward. I think that's that's my understanding, belief. But there is support there, but it's just that in some, uh, they... Some of the senators think that it's better uh, remain under an executive order rather than uh, create an administration to create that office. That's not that's where it is right now. That's how I I I think of it. Right? So yeah, so the the, the but the interesting thing to you that you mentioned that Palau is the first one among the FAS. Look to, uh, to have established this office. Uh, FSM and the Marshall Islands apparently are really interested in their, their... So, the So, which of the perhaps my mind was that did the US push this idea for these countries to establish that office? Or? So, from what I understand, there are people in the country who were advocating right. for it uh, early on. I think it, it, I mean, it was clearly an, an something that was needed. Um, and uh, uh, we we know, based on other things that the U.S. is pushing, is proposing. Sorry, a uh, another model for uh, the NSC. So there's a job advertisement currently for a national security advisor. I think that's the title for uh, RMI, and they are talking about hiring an American to that would be paid by the State Department to be put into the RMI government to do that job. And in the job description, there's no requirement for knowing anything about Marshall Islands. Right? So you can say that the idea came from different places, but what we see in Palau is very much of a Palauan idea where it's you know, run by somebody from Palau. Yeah, yeah well, it does almost just laugh when you hear of that, because what could a, an outsider, what could an American say? possibly know about what up the island of the Pacific needs for security. They may have some ideas um, based on quick study, but they will never know 
like a local person will. And I really got to stress that is you, if you want to do this right, it really requires uh, local expertise. And you know, it certainly exists in Palau. And I'll bet you it exists in Marshall Islands and Micronesia. But it, um, but it is, you see, you just especially, I guess I've been around long enough, but whenever an outsider comes in uh, and says, I know what, let me tell you what you need to do, that uh, you better, you know, make sure your wallet is still there after, or it just isn't going to be as effective as it could be. And why not? Well, why would it? And ultimately, it's saying, well, in, all, in this nation, even as a small nation, there's nobody who, else who can do this job. Um, it doesn't really ring true. May I, Fat Mayor, just comment on that is that uh, Palau is, is a really tight country. Yeah. And you've known each other forever. And you've known each other's families forever. So you, you, what I've found in, in listening to the discussions is you tend to focus on each other's defects and not on each other's strengths. Right. So you'll bring up something that happened 30 years ago to somebody who can actually be incredibly valuable in another capacity. So um, part of it is just realizing, I mean, we've met all sorts of people here who've taught me at least a credible amount about strategic issues and the realities of the region. And, and um, I would just recommend really listening to each other. And that's why this idea of a think tank, a kind of a local think tank or something, which would be very helpful. You know, one thing about the NSC, when it was forced to establish that Miss Jennifer answer is I also have a separate one in here. Uh, one thing that has really improved uh, as far as uh, the media's uh, awareness of the uh, U.S. Uh, military activities, especially the trainings that comes on Iraq, is that uh, the, the NSC answer gives us those information. So once she gives us away, I know that maybe she has cleared it with the uh, president or authorities that are part of that. Uh, Organize those and it and before that it was uh, you get to only to know after the fact or after the the training has already started but it's uh, it has improved that line of communication between the media and the government with regards to military trainings yeah, so as well. Can you describe the 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 coordination and how has it it has improved so much from last year in Peleliu when we visited the military there and the economic. Uh, yeah, it was very interesting, just very quickly, that I was talking to our tour guide. And he said that right now there are about 60 military personnel in Hell anywhere. Their project is to improve the airflow. I may just bring that up because I think that's a success of having a the coordination office. And, 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 and you know that uh, there, he said that all the hotel rooms, the lodgings, accommodations uh, for rent uh, has been taken by the military. Uh, and then they have two restaurants or a restaurant. And so they, at lunchtime, dinner, then they would frequent those places. So it's, the small stores, like they're making bentos. Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, money going to the previous people, so the pressure to Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the first time, when, like last year, was it two years ago, when they came, they had to shuttle them every day from Peru to Pelinu. Because there was no coordinate. But but yeah, but it's not those but it's not all good because you know, like here, uh, I think it was last year when you get to see like those military vehicles on the road. Uh, and that's not a sight that we are used to. I don't like to see that. I mean I mean that's how I see them. When the people look at those uh, they do uh, they see and and, and and are very concerned uh with that kind of uh, scene that is starting to to, to be out there in the and since after the war now we don't See those. The only kind of uh, military uh, equipment they are from the, the the civil action teams, which you know those are community activities that uh, we uh, ask the client that. Yeah. So it's good in that regard, but also there is also uh, concerns from many in the community that they uh, what's going on here. Right. So it's one of the things a national security coordinated desk office does is it explains. Um, it takes away the mystery, takes away the suspicion. Uh, if it does right, you, it does require enough enough staff to be able to focus on that. Uh, but what you described is, is immensely important. Yeah, this, 
Um, how do you see Palau in the next uh, five years? Like last year, we had a British um, naval ship visiting um, Britain and France. They have um, influence in the South Pacific. And with this tension with China, do you see an increase in the French, Australians, and British military presence in the Western Pacific? Well, you would know the French better than, than me, but the, I think you're going to see more. More. Um, I don't know that it's going to be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the twice as much or ten times as much. There's going to be more. It'll be more regular. Um, and it, but I say I don't know that they you'll see see a whole lot more. But there's certainly a recognition of the importance of the Western Pacific Palau, and more people doing things. I think you'll see the Japanese here a little more. Or in the area a little more. And as you said, the French, the British, um, even the Germans came to the Western Pacific. But keep in mind that the French and the British and Europeans, they have very small navies, so they might send a ship. Um, but the say the Americans are the are they are the, the key to a lot of things, but they really need help and they need places to be, you know, to be able to go to set up in places. Um, not to set up huge camps or forts or bases, but a place where they can come in and, and operate on a modest, uh, efficient scale. Uh, so those places, the ge geography is what it is, and Palau has a very good location. Uh, so but the important thing is to sensibly, you know, have these sensible relations and a defense presence. Um, and the, you know, do keep in mind that the compacts require the Americans to take responsibility for national defense. And I would like to see them include illegal fishing in that, uh, more than they have to date. Um, speaking of illegal fishing, that's a very good example of gray zone activities. Uh, we mentioned it earlier, but never defined it. But think of it as, uh, you know, an example would be illegal fishing boats coming into Palau or, say, Chinese survey ships that are coming in to see where your cables are um, what it looks like underwater so their uh, submarines can operate better. Um, you know, they come in and it's it's illegal and they shouldn't do it. They know they shouldn't do it, but they also know that nobody is likely to shoot at them. Nobody is likely to really challenge them uh, because they're afraid of one starting a war or losing business, etc. So that gray zone are these actions that are um, that really hurt you and that irritate you and but there is, there's not enough to push back like that. So that's one example. The, the term comes from it not being either black or white, right? So it's operating in this room. Sort of but it's only operating in that gray area because the people who should be pushing the, the clean part up to the line of the black part aren't doing their job. So the, so the, uh, the kind of illegal activity gets push and push. It's, some people don't like that term because it's just illegal activity, you know. But it's not being uh, prosecuted. So, in Galapagos, I was doing to him, I think. So, but I, I, I just read this the last uh, questions. It was like, nowadays, we're from about, I mean, one of the worst that has come into our lexicon is Indo Pacific. With a flight wave. Japan is free and open in the Pacific, the US uh, in no Pacific, in this Indo Pacific strategy. Uh, so, and then a lot of people are saying that. Uh, why? What happened to the Asia Pacific? Why is it the Pacific? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so that would you uh, care to comment on that? Uh, yeah. I, I, I was used to Asia Pacific right. because that's what I used for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And then they changed it one day. And I think they changed it because it was easier than uh, doubling the size of the American Navy or building more anti-ship cruise missiles. Uh, but it's easier to change the name. No, it, it's somebody at Indo Pacom, Pacific Command, decided, well, if we call it Indo Pacom, Indo Pacific Command, this will show that we include the Indians. And uh, it was for um, almost marketing purposes. I, if you said, does this changing the name, did that help America's military power, its diplomatic presence? Not really. I think it's more what you do. Was it, uh, was it that? Uh, created to counter the Chinese, uh, China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative? Well, it could be, you know, but it, it, if it was, I would, so I would suggest that maybe um, cutting off the flow of U.S. dollars that China uses to fund the Belt and Road Initiative 
might have been more effective. But it that's what we do. You know, we're big on branding, and um, but the I a little thing funny about it. But um, you have to ask what effect did the name change have? And I'd say, oh, at and most, so, okay, at most uh, a little bit. But it is nice to have the Indians, you know, recognized and doing more because they have a role to play in the Pacific as well. It, it also has had, has been presented as having more maritime connotations, the land-based connotations. So you hear a lot less about Central Asia now than you would have been under the... Uh, um, but the, but the, going back to your question, Marvin, about the French and the whatever, all those people, um, I, don't, I, I'm, I don't think we're in a linear time, right? I don't, I don't think we can look at what we have today and project. And one of the changes, for example, coming out of Panuelo's letter, it's very possible Panuelo has, he has two months left when he's president, and he might recognize Taiwan, right? He can, he thinks legally he can do it. And then you have the three FAS recognizing Taiwan. And it would be nice to see a lot more Taiwanese, you know, uh, I don't know, is it a Navy? What do they call it? Yeah, you know, coming in through the region and, and working alongside the Japanese and the Americans and really creating a... And that's what uh, China is uh, threatening, like they're, it's being constricted so that's the other side that may trouble yeah, China. Yeah, somebody punches you and you block the punch, that's not being constricted. Yeah, you know, really, go back to your, or all of our experience with bullies in the schoolyard, when you would try to defend yourself, you said, why are you trying, you're, why are you trying to threaten me? That you're, you're fighting, no, you're fighting me. Well, you're the guy that, you have to, all China has to do is just behave uh, and it, find it has no enemies at all. But that's, you'll hear the argument, you know, we're being constrained, contained. Maybe just last question, and maybe this will explain to uh, Palauans why China is, uh, what, why does China want to take Taiwan back? History, maybe. So, because I asked earlier, like, would China risk its economy to go to war for Taiwan? And so I think you're right. Uh, it's, it's, and it's not about economy, it's about history and its territorial integrity. Taiwan was part of the Chinese dynasty. Or China, Taiwan has never been part of the People's Republic of China. Not the People's Republic, but di dynasties. If you look actually at Taiwan, in, in the, the rest, say, the, mm. before 1949. Taiwan was only for about a decade under Chinese control, and that was during um, a dynasty that was not even, it was for about, it was in the 19th century, and that was a dynasty that wasn't even Chinese. They were Manchus. Um, uh, before that, Taiwan was, China had really no interest in or control, real control over Taiwan, but they present it as being the opposite. And this is simply historically wrong, but they have gotten so many people to think, well, it's always been part of China. Uh, what, you know, how can we say it isn't? And, but the fact is, Taiwan has never been, except for that one decade in whatever, how many thousand years of Chinese history um, that has never been part of, of China. And the, once again, it goes back to that question. Are we going to allow 23 million free people to be enslaved? And it was a question that was in the 1930s. We heard the same question. And ultimately, I think that is what's at, what's at stake uh, with it. But it's amazing how the, the history is. Um, if, you, if you asked most Americans, that they say, you know, Taiwan's part of China. Well, that's what China says. But what's the reality? And mm -hmm. it almost be like the Americans saying, well, Mexico's part of uh, the United States or Canada's part of the United States. I think some people, as I'm Canadian, right? So sitting next to an American, I, I could see the chair coming closer and closer in the border as it goes. But everyone knows yeah. it's part of America. Well, it isn't. But, but, the, but so if it's not history, the question is, what is it? And the answer is geography. So if you put up a map, you talk about the second island chain, and that's the first island chain. So they've got this massive navy that's now the biggest in the world, and it has to get out of that basin where the South China Sea is and, and out to here. And it's got Japan blocking it, it's got Taiwan, it's got Philippines, it's got that whole chain blocking it. So if it can take Taiwan, it blows a hole in the chain, and it can get out. Yeah, the next stop will be a Coral. It's an excellent heart. Yeah. If I'm not really joking. Yeah. Beta. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure uh, uh, speaking with you, Duke and Marvin. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. And thank you for coming uh, for this uh, special Pop Zapper program. So thank you so much. Uh, 
I hope uh, we will have a nice uh, trip back home and I uh, hope we will have an opportunity also to come back again. Right? The book signing. Yeah. So like, yeah. So, so, uh, Mr. Ran, the news, I'm going to go to the TV and screen the TV when China attacks. And I'm going to publish the news and I'm interested in going to the news. Well, the merit, yeah, well, the bring us to you for a week. Sell book, uh, the mail, the one that I was a program, and the mail, the target, the other road hit. Well, the merit, yeah, and I'm going to ask you. Maybe, yeah.